one, but since I, I come from a clock family, I, I realized this was less a casual thing and more of like a like a bar mitzvah. Like it was almost like a coming of age, <laughs> coming of age speech. So the next few minutes could well determine the uh, the path of my life. So a lot rides. <laughs> um, okay, so I was kind of going to give you a presentation on the history of time, the history of timekeeping, not just clocks, but all timekeeping devices. So. What I'm about ready to say isn't going to really be um, exhaustive um, because uh, I'll, we only have so much time, no pun intended. Um, but uh, I'm trying to hit all the, you know, the really major advancements and all of the big discoveries that have made since the beginning of time. So the first place I'd like to start is um, in ancient Egypt where we have obelisks. And you know, obelisks, they project a shadow on a place on the ground, right? And whereas before, you know, mankind probably understood that there was some relation between, you know, the, the projection of shadows off like a feet, like a terrain feature, like a topographical feature or like a tree or something. This was, you know, kind of mankind's first attempt to build something of its own that could track that more accurately. Um, and so the, the first Egyptian obelisks um, that we can date are from around 4000 BC. So timekeeping kind of began around this time. And then um, following that, we have water clocks. And water clocks, kind of like obelisks or sundials, are also kind of a, they're less mechanical and more natural because it judges time by the flowing of water, right? Which again is another kind of, you know, a natural mechanism rather than a, a, a man-made one. And so um, there's a lot of different dates that you can get for when water clocks were initially developed or initially um, invented, but uh, most tend to, tend to agree that the first ones were in China and they were around the same time as obelisks, so something like 6,000 years ago or so. And of course, you have like a series or multiple buckets or bowls and um, water would flow from one to the other and the very, at the very last bowl or bucket would have time marked on the side of it. So as water filled it up, you could roughly judge about how much time had passed. And um, China was the first to initially develop this, but eventually this technology became very popular in Western civilization, in places like Greece and Rome. And the really interesting thing about this is there's because those places we have greater historical records from, we can actually see, you know, verbatim in different manuscripts that have been passed down to us through time, the use of clocks and how they were used by people in antiquity. And so a very good example of this is we know uh, for a fact that there was a water clock in the school of Athens, Plato's famous, you know, school of philosophy. And um, this clock, in fact, had, uh, lead balls placed in the very last bucket that the water would flow into. And so as the bucket filled, it would tip over, causing the lead balls to spill over into this kind of copper plate. And this, the sound that the lead balls made hitting the copper was loud enough to function as kind of like an early alarm. And so this is, it, it would wake up the students of the school. And so this is one of the very first instances we have of you know, any type of alarm in a clock. Um, another really interesting example of this, it was used in courts, like legislative courts. And um, the, uh, these were called clepsydra, which is a Greek word which literally means water thief. And basically, uh, it's kind of a very similar mechanism, but they would be used to effectively uh, stop lawyers from speaking too long or out of turn, they would have a certain amount of time that would be judged by the clock. And so there's a few um, just quotes here that I, uh, that I found that I thought were really interesting. Plato in one of his uh, documents said, quote, those men on the other hand always speak in haste for the flowing water urges them on. Another quote from this time, it's a, a Roman, his name was Lucius. He says, quote, the clerk of the court began bawling again, this time summoning the chief witness for the prosecution to appear. Up stepped an old man. He was invited to speak as long as there was water in the clock. This was a hollow globe into which water was poured through a funnel in the neck and from which it gradually escaped through fine perforations at the base. So 
clocks were in some uncommon use in both uh, Greece and Rome in like, you know, the, the fourth to third centuries BC. And uh, in 325 BC, the very first water clocks got a dial with an hour hand. And in 100 BC, they fixed uh, a very pertinent problem with water clocks, and that was water pressure. The more water that you had, the faster or slower it would flow. And so the way that they got around this, you know, because the, the water would flow unevenly based on how much water was left in the tank, is a conical, like a cone shape, so that the, the water pressure up at the top would have more surface area, and thus it would be a relatively even flow as it got closer to the base. Um, and then, interestingly, after water clocks, there became uh, more interest in sundials, and sundials, which are kind of, you know, like a more miniaturized version of obelisks, were um, kind of the next step in the development of time. And uh, the, one of the first ones that the Bees found, again in Egypt, in the, uh, the Valley of the Kings, and this dates to about 1500 BC, um, and uh, <clears throat> sundials sun were probably used before this, but this is the first kind of confirmed date that we have. And then um, in, uh, later on in the 4th century AD, the largest sundial in the history of the world was built by uh, Emperor Augustus, a Roman emperor, um, and it's called Solarium Augusti, named after himself. And uh, this came um, a few years after the development of the Julian calendar. And of course, the Julian calendar named after Julius Caesar. So not only were the, the, the Romans um, instrumental in the development of time, but also you know, in the calendar and the months and seasons. <clears throat> um, then we have the hourglass, which is you know, kind of a little bit less complicated, simplified uh, way to measure time, similar to kind of like a, a water clock. And um, the first known evidence we have of these existing is from about the 4th century BC, around circa 350. And uh, these are found in a depiction in a uh, sarcophagus that was unearthed. And um, we don't really know too much about the development of the hourglass, but we know that it wasn't common until something like the 11th century AD, so thousands of years later, when it was used primarily aboard ships. And in fact, in 1522, when Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the globe, he had 18 hourglasses on each one of his ships um, in order to keep track of time, which is hard when there, you don't have any geographical features to aid in your navigation. Um, and so this kind of brings us to the very first mechanical clock, something like this that we typically think of when we think of the word um, clock. And uh, the first mechanical clock was designed in the seventh century BC by a Chinese monk who, <clears throat> um, it was again something more in line with a water clock. A lot of the mechanism wasn't gears. The first geared clock was invented in the 11th century AD. So fast forward 1800 years, it's a long stretch in time. The 11th century AD um, by Ibn Khalad al Maradi, who is a, uh, an Iberian Muslim or a, a Spanish Muslim. And um, the first verge escapement was designed in 1325. And that kind of brings us to about where we are right here with this block, which is a, a foliate escapement. The, the uh, <clears throat> trying to think of the word here, the, uh, the longest running clock that is currently in operation that we know of is in the Salisbury Cathedral in England. And that clock was finally put into use, in operational use, in uh, 1390. And the interesting thing about that clock, and probably this clock as well, when it was first in, when it was first designed, is that it did not have a dial. There was nothing on it that actually told time visually. It was all sounds, auditory. It would strike a certain amount of times on the hour, and that would tell you what time it is. And that, this is actually where we get the word clock. Klocke comes from uh, it passed down from Latin, it was Dutch, and then it became English, and it literally means bell. So clock, or a sound very similar to it in Latin, the language of Rome, meant bell. And that is how we have gotten the name for the instrument of, of time that we now know today. Um, and so uh, how did we get from this escapement that is horizontal that goes back and forth 
like this to a vertical movement. Well, Galileo, the, the famous scientist, noticed um, one day in a cathedral in Pisa the swinging of a chandelier and thought to himself that maybe there might be some type of regularity and consistency to such a movement that would make it a, that would make it a, a, you know, something that could judge the passage of time accurately. And he unfortunately was not able to really kind of see the, the, the fruit of uh, his, his thoughts and his ideas. And it wasn't until 16, about 1650, 1660, somewhere in there, there was a Dutch scientist named of Christian Huygens who finally put a pendulum into a clock and came up with, you know, the, the things that we think of today, the grand, uh, you know, like a grandfather clock, a wall clock um, type movement. And so he's, he and Galileo are kind of, they were standing on the shoulders of giants, obviously, but they are kind of the, the two men combined made the modern clock that we now know. And um, Christian Huygens as well was also, also invented the, the balance spring, which is what is used in uh, many watches. And so not only was he very influential in the development of clocks, but also um, watches, which until the invention of the ba balance spring were nearly completely unreliable. Um, and so after we get to kind of the modern clocks, the next big step that time uh, took was the chronometer, the marine chronometer. In 1707, um, the British government, after a major um, disaster in which uh, through navigational um, technical difficulties, I guess you could say, the British Navy lost several ships that were running aground on a coast. Um, because at this time, there was no good way of judging longitude. It was impossible because there was no good way of judging time aboard a ship. Pendulums were accurate, you know, in a cathedral, in a turret, in a castle, but not aboard a ship, which would be, you know, bucking to and fro on the ocean. And so um, the British government put out a 20,000 pound reward, which, you know, at the time was a tremendous sum for the first person who could come up with a timekeeping device that would be accurate aboard a ship. And so the man who eventually won uh, the reward in 1761 was John Harrison, who was a Yorkshire-born uh, <clears throat> Englishman. And he worked on the chronometer 31 years before finally um, receiving the reward. And uh, when it was in, in its initial trial, uh, the chronometer was run for 10 weeks, and after 10 weeks, the chronometer was examined and it was found that it was only off after all the, uh, you know, 70 days, by, it was only off by five seconds. And so um, after the, the, the trial and he was, uh, you know, this was the, the very first um, accurate chronometer aboard a ship. And so um, after that we have uh, quartz clocks which are significantly, you know, less interesting probably for most people who are interested in more traditional um, mechanical clocks, but they were invented in 1927 by um, two people at the Bell Telephone Laboratories in uh, Canada. Of course, at the time, quartz were expensive to make. People didn't want to invest the money in them, so it wasn't until the 60s that they were really a uh, commercially viable product um, <clears throat> much later. And so um, in the 1950s, the very first atomic clock, which is kind of what we think of today as like the gold standard for timekeeping, um, that, that they were invented after the, the Second World War. And um, right now, as of today, they're kind of the, the most accurate timekeeping devices available. And um, in, in 2004, there was a clock that was uh, commissioned in Switzerland, which is, it, it was named the FOCS-1. Um, I'm sure that stands for something very important, but I'm completely unaware of its meaning at the moment. <laughs> Um, but it's an atomic, it's an atomic casium, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, casium fountain clock. And it has an uncertainty of less than one second every 30 million years. And so that clock is by far the most accurate timekeeping device on planet Earth. And so I would like to uh, wrap, wrap this all up with talking about one specific, very interesting clock. It, a mechanism called the Antikythera. And the Antikythera, we're going back to the third century BC, 
in um, <clears throat> 1902, there was a group of excavators who, in the, uh, in the sea, close to an island off the coast of Greece, unearthed in a Greek trireme a mechanical device. It was huge. It consisted of 37 gears. And uh, it was called the Antikythera, uh, excuse me, Antikythera mechanism because it was found off the island of Antikythera. And um, basically, long story short, what these archaeologists discovered is that the mechanism aboard this ship, which could, which tracked, I, I believe, over 40 different celestial events that occurred, things like the ellipses, you know, of the moon. It went through the uh, the zodiac with both the, the sun and the moon, um, that it, this was somewhere in the region of 1,400 years before its time. They dated it to the third century BC. There was nothing like it in the time, and there would be nothing like it until something like 1400 AD in Europe. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, where would we be? How much further along would we be in time if something like this wasn't lost and you know in the at the bottom of the ocean someone clearly had a brilliant mind and yet for whatever reason their ideas and what they their product was lost forever and uh, mankind was you know wasn't able to take advantage of what they had discovered um, and so that's kind of my presentation on time uh, thank you uh, so much for listening I hope you enjoyed it thank you. Hey, Jared, tell them a little bit about this particular clock and about us getting it and that kind of stuff. Like, who made this and what kind of material is it? Right, uh, so this would be made out of um, wrought iron. It was found in the basement of a cathedral in Reims, France. Um, if it's wrought iron, that means it would have been made by a, a blacksmith. It's not cast iron. <clears throat> um, uh, and we recently acquired it. We went to El Paso in Texas and uh, bought it off a guy who uh, was in Europe in the military and he bought it off a buddy who was uh, apparently acquired it in, in Reims. He said it was at the basement of a, of a cathedral there. So we actually don't know what the exact cathedral is. We're trying to pinpoint the exact one, but we do know that the clock is something around 500 years old, which makes it one of the oldest clocks working period and possibly the oldest clock in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, what, what you're looking here is older than anything they have in the uh, Any Watch and Clock Museum in the United States. And it's uh, definitely at least a, a museum-worthy piece. So it's pretty cool stuff. Thank you, JR. Very, very cool.